Hmm? If it's just you and me. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know as much risk of that. Yeah, I, yeah exactly. Uh, welcome, everybody. We are live and on the air. This is the Town Council's Finance Committee meeting. It's a little after 6 o'clock on October 17th here in Council Chambers A. And um, we're going to call the uh, meeting to order. We have a fairly brief um, agenda. <laughs> and just for the record, um, we have two of the council members present, um, and Councilor Chiazzo is on his, we're hoping, is on his way. Uh, so let the record reflect. And then we also have um, Tom, actually, I'll let you do the introduction sure. since you have someone new on that side of the table. Yeah, terrific. I'm very pleased to have Larissa Crockett, the new assistant town manager here. And one of Larissa's duties, among many, will be uh, assisting us in the first the conversation and then uh, preparing the metrics and, and helping report those back out to you over time. So great. it's great that she's come on at this time and can be part of the conversation from its beginning. And, of course, we have Ruth Porter, finance director, and Gina Kluke, deputy director here as well. Awesome, and of course we have the real boss, uh, Colette, <laughs> is here helping us with our minutes. Really like keeping time, right? Yeah, keeping time for us this evening with the stopwatch. Um, so uh, with that, um, moving on to the approval of the minutes for September 14, 2016. There is a motion. Motion to approve them. Second. All in favor? Excellent. Um, moving on to the September 30th um, interim financial statements. Again, just for the record, these are internal unaudited statements. Um, this is the third presentation, I think, or maybe, yeah, third presentation. And I'll turn that over to you. And yeah, uh, we uh, try to simplify things a bit. I, I think in the effort to, to provide some additional information last month, we might have complicated things a bit. So we've simplified. Uh, we're certainly presenting the balance sheet as has been our, become our custom and will continue to. And then there's some detail on both revenue and expenditure. Um, you know, Ruth and I did a little debrief after the last meeting, and uh, we really you know, want to provide the, the information that you're interested in, and so it, it's a bit uh, disappointing to us that we feel like we're not connecting with you at some level. So I'm not sure how we can improve upon that, but um, I did have Ruth do a little uh, research with her colleagues around, and frankly, what you're seeing is far more detailed than most. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but mm -hmm. um, you're getting a lot more information than, than most do, and I think it's just a matter of level of comfort and appetite uh, but again, we're pleased to provide the information that you're seeking, and uh, I guess we're open to ongoing suggestions how we can improve that. So um, in this, uh, Ruth, um, has anything materially changed um, from a, uh, an inter like a, a higher level position well, from the last report? The last report was as of June. I didn't yeah. prepare those this time because we were doing the September reports. So these are September of this fiscal year. Um, oh, uh, yes. So I don't think at this stage the June ones had changed all that much. So we are reporting year over year in terms of how we compare. There's a couple of takeaways in the, in the cash on hand and as well uh, with the, um, the taxes re receivable. And that those two things combined, it strikes me, really make the difference in what you're seeing down at the bottom of the fund balance. No, Ruth could perhaps speak to the cash. Tax receivable, I suspect, has a fair amount to do with the fact that there's a higher tax rate this year and therefore there's, it's producing mm -hmm. more money. Higher tax rate. Um, we also, at, this is as of the end of September, so uh, we don't have as many, we're not as collected as we would otherwise be. At the end of September, uh, we were at 30, we, let me see. We should be at 25% as of October 12th, which is when I ran these reports, we were at 32.6% today after uh, tax deadline, but before mail from tomorrow, which is accepted as today's, we right now we're at 46.7 collected. So, so go ahead. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Oh. J just a quick question, which then kind of ties into the conversation we started last time. So if I look at fund balance unrestricted, it's showing a $2.7 million increase since from last September to this September. Correct. And so we know probably a million and a half of that is the Wentworth debt service that we used. But that would seem to indicate, as we sit here now, that our budget's generated about a million dollars in surplus. Is that, is that a fair statement or not a fair statement or close but no cigar? It's, um, I think it's pretty close, yeah. 
So at some point I'd like to understand of that, so we know about Wentworth, we understand Wentworth, but of the million dollar surplus, where did it come from? What, what, I mean, I, I know you can't answer it tonight, but I'd like, just, just for budgeting purposes, it, we seem to always be, it's one thing if we purposely plan to create a fund balance to get to where we want to be, but if our budgets are consistently creating significant surpluses, it means we're actually collecting revenues from taxpayers that we may or may not need. So I'd like to better understand whether what, what, how much of the million was on the municipal side, how much of the million was on the school side. I'm going to, if I could, I, I can answer probably two of those. And okay. The first one is excise. We were way over collected. It's pretty much um, something that's been going on across the state where most communities were well over what they estimated for revenue. But that was that was like, what, 50000 or 60000 or Was it how, how big? Oh, no, much it was like almost 700, it's almost 7 or 800, We were 700000 over budget? Correct. And so, so most of so the 700 was on the municipal side? I think all of it's on the, most of it's on the municipal yeah. side because the other piece was uh, overlay where we budgeted uh, a higher amount of overlay to help offset uh, potential legal tax, tax appeals tax appeals thank you that those haven't come to fruition yet so those are uh, so those funds we created the overlay no. but we didn't really spend it so that will also fall back to it, it, it becomes fund balance uh, yeah. It's raised money that wasn't needed for operations. So, so Tom, I think I think we'll get into the conversation later. But when you asked about what might be helpful, mm -hmm. that's one <coughs> that would really be helpful to me on the, the unrestricted change? fund balance from year to year changes. Try to identify what were the items mm -hmm. that created the yep. change, mm -hmm. and then that may so if it is excise tax, and I know we've adjusted excise tax in the past in the budgets. Mm -hmm. But in the next planning budget cycle, once we find out what's where our line items may be overly conservative, right. um, there's ways that we can maybe tighten that up so that we get a little mm -hmm. closer to budgets should really, you know, except for unusual events, really be pretty close. So, yeah, well, pro yeah. property tax revenues trend, you know, very very accurately. So if it's uh, if it's additional non-property tax revenue, in this case excise, or it's we're not spending everything. The fact is, all of that falls to the property tax, and your point's well taken. That um, it suggests that we're raising more than we need to run operations. The other, p I do believe that there were other two other components that were part of that that were identified last year. One was the planning department and the excess revenues that were generated from permits through the planning department, because they were pretty. I'm talking uh, well over a hundred thousand dollars differential um, or variance in the budget, and then also, which has always been, um, what's the word? I don't want to call it a cash cow. Um, it has always generated, um, the community service department has always generated more revenue than projected, as well as had greater expenses, but the net has always been contributing to the surplus. I think this past year, though, it was significantly lower than prior years. I was going to say, I don't think they did that this year necessarily. It was, it was lower, because I remember us talking about whether or not the fees have gotten to that point where we need to be careful mm -hmm. of, of not driving that. So, I, but I agree as far as understanding. We'll give you a more detailed list, kind of to just confirm what, what Ruth told you. I think it's going to come down to a handful of items that really make up that other. And it's kind of difficult, too, because we're creating these budgets essentially 18 months before the well, end no, of the no, I mean, fiscal year. Is, yeah. This isn't trying to find yeah. fault, but no, no, I for, know. for instance, if, if we start this schedule and we see every year it's excise tax, Correct. that we we're have a surplus, that, is, that means the next budget cycle, so that's a place that we can legitimately maybe be adjust. Right. adjust. Yeah. And I think we adjusted up 400,000 this year yeah. um, in, light of, in view of that knowledge. Yep. Okay. So, to, so to, to highlight one piece, and this is actually a nice presentation to focus on that. So when you look at page two, which really goes over the general fund because you have year over year. So the question I would have is that while this year the general fund expenditures are lower mm -hmm. in its allocation in comparison to last year, does that compare favorably to industry averages for this particular point in time? So last year we had spent 32.5. This year we spent 26.1. Someone might say, well, that's, that's actually good um, because you're spending less than you did last, or not as fast, not less, but not as fast. But if the average is 25 or if the average is only 10%, that's the benchmark that we want to measure against because it's really, the number doesn't tell, for me, it doesn't tell me anything. So what, what is the benchmark to measure that against if we're I okay? I think uh, in, in terms of 
September 2016 to September 2015, the, the biggest difference is in the county tax. Yeah, tax yeah. Last year we Fine paid issue, it in September. This year it's not getting paid till this year, month. How come? Why is there a difference? And isn't there a standard due date to it? Or the it standard due date is September 15th or before, or you have until after your taxes are uh, due, which is October 15th for us. And then they don't start assessing a penalty until November 1st. So as long as they have their money by November 1st or October 31st, they, they're all set. So Yeah, because that swings the numbers quite a bit. Yeah, that's two and a half million. Actually, that would make it almost even. Yeah. Slightly lower. So I think we pretty but, much yeah. track, you know, yep. unless there's yep. some something like this we're we're pretty well 25 percent you know but even if they're a absolutely the same number you know um the question is is that does that compare favorably to what it's supposed to be at um should it be higher should it be lower um and it might be based upon simply your expertise and whether or not we should be where we are i'm just looking for a, ben a benchmark to gauge that against mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's oversimplistic to say 25%. It's just a quarter of the year, quarter of yeah. the year. Um, there's a cyclical, there's seasonality that affects certainly public right. works. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it's actually not exactly what you think. It, they're getting most of the stockpiles of salt and sand uh, over the summer months and, and in the fall. It's not the winter. That's when they're using it, but we're spending the money in uh, a quarter or two ahead of that, mm -hmm. sometimes a full year. And then also, you know, the bulk of what we do as a municipality is service, so it's you know, wages and benefits, and those should be, with the exception of maybe overtime, those should be fairly Pretty predictable, consistent yep. in terms of the 25%. <coughs> Ruth did uh, provide a note under executive, uh, the executive portion. Uh, we've had a retirement. unprecedented number of long time, we're talking 30 and 40, some 45 year employees uh, retiring, and there's a, a fairly significant um, settlement with accrued vacation and sick. Um, so that's one of the reasons, that is the reason that that's uh, kind of out of whack compared to last year. You know, Sean, that kind of, not, not for tonight, but those types of things where you see these types of fluctuations because we're sort of on a paid basis rather than a cruel basis, whether at some point, so you kind of even out, so it's easier for people sitting on this side of the table to try to figure out trends, whether at some point, and, and I know it's more work, but just have a discussion about the pros and, and cons of being on a full accrual basis. Mm -hmm. Because on an accrual basis, you would have, the county tax would be in this number. Correct. Because it was, it was due technically the 15th. So at some point, Sean, yep. not, not for tonight, but I think that, that would take some of these variations out of, out of the numbers. Um, but it's a lot more work, I understand. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Great. Any other questions? No, those, are, those actually were my two questions. Is this format and this level of detail yes. sufficient? Uh, I, I, think so. I think we can okay. always do uh, do better uh, just by adding additional footnotes and kind of explanatory notes. Uh, we'll try our best to flag things and answer your questions before you have to ask them. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Yep, I'm fine. Great. Um, and so f with that, if you don't, if there's no objection. Um, by uh, Councillor Hayes, I'd like to get a copy and have this as part of the next, um, I'm not going to be there, but the next uh, town council meeting as part of the finance committee report. Sure, the, uh, two days, yeah. two days from now? Um, no, I can wait for the next one after. Next, okay. Yeah. Just what financial reports for the council meeting, uh, first one in November. First one in November. Excellent. Um, so, I don't think we need to accept those, do we? I don't need a motion to accept those, do we? All right. Uh, moving on to undesignated fund balance policy. Uh, just for a high level, because I, sometimes I forget we're bringing tapes. So the town council has what is called a fund balance policy. We've started this conversation. Um, it's actually only been in, implemented for approximately 14 years, about, um, at least at the level that it's currently at. Um, however, when you actually read the fund balance policy, it actually only addresses um, undesignated funds or unrestricted funds. It doesn't really talk about the other categories of the fund balance. And the purpose of our conversation is to better define the policy to be inclusive of all the other issues, <coughs> but also to uh, relook at the current measurements that we have and the thresholds that we have set in place for the undesignated fund. 
Um, with that, um, I believe you have a copy of um, this is, and that's a revised. This is the revised mm -hmm. one. So if you can, uh, it has the 1017 in the corner. I think it's part of this. I have to apologize because um, I'd actually worked on all the recommendations from the last meeting, but didn't get it over to Colette in time to be distributed in advance. So um, is it there yet? This one here. So this one that is attached to the agenda um, has the changes that we had discussed from the last meeting and some modifications, um, and we can go through that. The goal is hopefully is that we have a recommendation that we can forward to the council. It is something the council has been expecting from us. And so um, with that, I kind of want to um, just kind of have an open conversation with staff and us and what we would like to do. Um, I know Chris had some opinions on this as well, um, but I don't believe um, it's anything that will prevent us from moving this forward. It's, it's simply a, a more narrative approach. Um, what I did include in here, though, is um, two things. One is outside of the definitions, which, by the way, this is a pretty standard template of a policy from um, several municipalities that I looked at. It seems like it's a generic um, policy. The only real um, change that is specific to our town um, that I changed is it really in the unassigned fund balance area, which is on page two. And so I just wanted to kind of uh, put this out um, because I think that's the most important piece. Um, and just a, a high level because I don't want to read the whole piece. Um, the town has set a goal through this fund balance policy to maintain the level of unassigned fund balance equal to 10% of Scarborough's operating budget for the prior fiscal year and not to fall below 8.33% or 1 12th of Scarborough's operating budget. Once the town achieves an unassigned fund balance of 10% of Scarborough's operating budget, an excess of about 12% must be assigned by any combination of one of the following. And there is a list of five items um, roughly, uh, one is to uh, simply retain um, in non-spendable non restricted accounts that offset unfunded liabilities. Um, this is our conversation around those um, off-balance sheet um, mm -hmm. items that we're okay. concerned with, with pensions and other issues that are coming forward uh, for accounting purposes. Uh, retained and assigned accounts that may be used for future budget cycles as property tax stabilization um, or available for use during catastrophic, event, catastrophic events or fund funding future capital expenditures and or projects, the retirement of debt and or a taxpayer refund. Um, the rest I'm not going to go through. The importance, just to recap, the importance of the list was that the prior policy simply said that any excess that is not being um, used must go towards capital expenditures or capital projects and expenditures. Um, it, there was no other really options, although technically I, I suppose the council could do whatever it wants because it's a legislative body. But this provides at least a list of options. And the reason is that times change. There are times where um, you want to be prudent and pay off debt that you can pay off debt because there are some restrictions in paying off debt because there are bonds that have been issued. Um, and there's times to save and there's times to um, if it truly is a prosperous, very, very prosperous a year, a taxpayer refund might be available. It's a very complex process, but it's at least something that I hope the citizens know that we do consider when we sit down and talk about balances. Um, the other piece that's more important is that the previous policy, um, and I don't have the original in front of me but if I'm, the, for the exact wording, but I believe it was simply stated that the policy, that the fund balance will never go below 5% but yet we want it to be equal to 8.3, which is the 1 12th that's a GASB guideline, and not to go above 10. What we've done is now move that forward so that the bottom is 8.3, the and mid is 10, and the max is 12. I just want to point out that policy did provide for both uh, either uh, property tax stabilization or capital needs. It's buried kind of in the Bearded middle of that paragraph it? you're looking at right there. Okay. And we talked a lot about that in, in the reason it was kept simple, and frankly, um, it's pretty clear to me that our capital needs um, are, are fairly consistent, fairly significant. Um, this past year was the first year we actually found ourselves in a position above 10 percent and even had a choice to make in that regard. Um, and the other reason that it was is really favored toward capital is that there's been a longstanding concern about uh, indebtedness and if there's a way that we can pay things as we go mm -hmm. using 
cash on hand or appropriated monies, that's a better way to do it. So it, it seems simple, but it's kind of elegant in its simplicity that it kind of addresses the long-term debt issue, uh, but it also, uh, and it also recognizes that we've got significant capital needs that are likely to be in the millions of dollars year in and year out. Um, that was the rationale used when that was updated. So, um, comments? Um, no, I mean, I, I think, you know, we talked about, I'm, I'm very comfortable with it. The only, it's more of a technical question. I was just a little confused. Once the town achieves an unassigned, unassigned fund balance of 10%, then an excess of, so are we saying we're only going to distribute the excess above 12, right? Correct. So it was kind of, once the town reaches 10%, I, I was kind of confused on what, then what? So I think it's more language than it is, subs I absolutely agree yeah. with the concept. So I don't know how to wordsmith that. And any uh, excess above? Yeah, the, I was, um, I think and should have been any. Yeah. So but oh, 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 any yeah. excess above yeah, 12 percent must be assigned. Yep, that does it. And, and the goal is that this. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, the finance committee and the council has the discretion between 10 and 12. Yep. Um, and 12 percent has to be assigned. And, and just so you know, um, I don't disagree. So I'm a banker. You know, I'm biased, so I believe in financing. <laughs> but, um, but on the same note, is that if you're going to finance, because rates today could be better than they were when you took out other debt, mm -hmm. the fact is that you could take that debt and you achieve the same by simply paying off older debt that has greater costs, both uh, whether it's maintenance costs, management costs, or whatever it might be. So you could use that to pay off the, that older debt and then finance newer debt that is less expensive. And so you can kind of achieve the same. Um, and the fact is, I just, you know, so it's, a, it's kind of a personal baby for me because when I first got on the council in 2001, it's always around there, we didn't even have a fund balance policy, I don't believe. I, it was very... It was 97, but I, I, practically speaking, yeah, I don't... I remember it being well below 3%. Yeah. Um, and so there was really not an acumen on how to manage ourselves to that because it was just a very different environment. That excess above 10% was going to, that was a lot of money. I mean, that $500,000 in capital expenditures for this town was huge. Mm -hmm. $500,000 today is nothing. I hate to say it that way, but it really, in comparison to the way the town has grown, it just, it doesn't have the same impact and the same control purposes. Let me ask, when do you expect that conversation would occur and decision be made in the event that we have monies in excess of 12%? Who's involved in the conversation as to what we do with it and when does that occur? Um, so, yeah, so I kind of, I left that out because I, I think the committee needs to decide that on, a, on an operational basis with the manager. I, I say it's, um, actually no, excuse me, I did put it in there in that last paragraph, um, in the event that the balance drops below Oh, sorry. That's below. That's below. Oh, twice annually, the town manager shall report to the town council's finance committee the statement of activity of all fund balances that will include the beginning year's balances, gross adjustments in and out of each account during the reporting period and final report period ending balances. Um, my goal is I would think that the finance committee, you would include that as part of any one of your periodic uh, financial statement reviews that you would give that report, and that would be the time in which we discuss appropriate levels of... Yeah, it would strike me, it, uh, it really ought to be audited, so it, it's probably going to be once a year when you really have great certainty around that number, yeah. and that's around the first of the year, yeah. uh, and it's probably a good conversation to have before the budget, is, um, because Frame those up. decisions would affect potentially how the yeah. budget yeah. is framed. Yeah. So I will say, so the language that was in this template um, does have typically that it's um, based on audited statements. The concern I have with that is the timing in which we receive our audited statements in comparison to our budget. We start budget in November. We don't get our audited statements until January and have our meeting in late January. So there's no way, unless we start receiving that significantly earlier. Uh, I, th I think it could work, Sean. Typically, the presentation to council is done in uh, mid to late January. I don't present my proposed budget until 1st of April. So, I mean, there's a little, there's enough time in between for conversations to occur. Um, I'm just not sure what level of confidence we'll have kind of mid-year to report on these fund balances. Um, mm -hmm. Not enough confidence to be making long-term decisions, right. I suspect. Uh, I'm just observing that that might be just problematic from a confidence in the data kind of point of view. And then the budget is really the vehicle whereby many of these uh, procedures would actually um, occur. I mean, capital would 
be folded in through the capital budget process, of course, uh, and even rate stabilization. Uh, historically, we've done that by using uh, a, a chunk of fund balance as a revenue, um, yeah. thereby reducing the need for property well. tax. So call it what you will, but that's the, that's the simplest way to in interject that kind of money into the taxpayer, as opposed to doing a yeah. full-blown refund, which is, I think, practically difficult, potentially. Yeah. Um, two pieces. One, I agree with you about the comments on the rate stabilization. To me, though, the purpose of having that separated in here is that in the event in which there is no growth and there is no expenditure increases, there is no capital and there's nothing, you could still use the fund to offset the rate. Yeah. So it's a cash infusion into the budget, mm -hmm. which is temporary. You know, I don't want to take care of the one year, but you have to then plan. That's where the long-term planning. So um, with his comments, um, there is templated language around the audited that this will be reviewed or presented by the town manager after the audited financial statements have been presented. Um, would you be okay in yeah. adding that? Yep, absolutely. Okay. That would be helpful, I think. Just so everyone no, knows okay. when to expect it. We all have confidence in the information when it's presented. Yeah, that's it. yeah. that's and so we'll take out the, um, the, the um, so by the way, what's below that is simply a an example. So this kind of gets into the whole communication pieces, and that is, um, I think everyone that will sit on a finance committee will hopefully understand that all the statements are point in time and that they're static um, and that they are not um, uh, moving. I mean, they move the day after or the minute after that you actually take this. What, what I was trying to get at is that I, I'm just looking for um, here are the types of fund balances and here is um, the beginning of the year, what went into it, what came out of it, and here's the end of the year or whatever that reporting period is. Um, that, that's what I kind of. So your that, intent was for that is. is it, it's kind of like this format. Only. It needs right, to be. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. details under each one, and yeah. I don't know. We can determine later, because here it shows, um, you know, reserved and then unreserved, and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so, a lot of that we don't have. But. Yeah, but I, I was trying to pick a picture yeah. um, without having to create something. This is this is also in our financial statements, statement three. If you were to look yeah. in the financials, you'll see this it's much lower because we don't have those different. Because I think from a council, from a committee and even council perspective, what we want to know is what is going in, because that's the only pieces that's hard to read, even in the audited financial statements. What is the balance of the beginning year? What went in and what came out? And then what is the net at the end? It's not even, I mean, unless you're a CPA, it's very hard to read an audited. Um, if I could make one suggestion is um, if we could somewhere in the definition to really define what the operating budget what do we include in that? Because right now, for me, operating budget would include the school, it would include the town. Uh, does it include food services? Does it not? Does it include? Um, is it the gross? Is it the net? Sure. So um, the original uh, policy had a statement about operating budgets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I took that out because this is a fund balance policy. I think that that statement needs to be put into the fiscal. But um, we do have a fiscal policy. We, we did that, maybe not elegantly, we did that so we would make sure it was calculated the same way every year. Because if you leave a couple of those variables out of it, it, make, it, it can totally skew and swing how you're reporting the fund balance. So if there's another way, we just want to make sure that we're doing it consistently and it survives us, frankly, so people can continue on, know how we did it, and be able to compare, um, do the calculation the same way every time. So that was really a definition of, for purposes of this calculation, yep. what is considered operating budget. And the school department, on the old one, it said funds 1,100 and 7,100. The school yeah, pulled adult data that. right out of it, so it's not even in that fund anymore. So, um, so the question I have is, so um, under the original definition, it's, it's labeled as a definition for operating budget, but then in the title it calls it a general fund budget. Is there a difference between the two? Some, some uh, municipalities have special revenue budgets. Yeah. They have, like us, capital budgets. Then they have, like, sewer special assessment budgets. Yeah. And uh, the only budget we really have, besides capital and general fund, are uh, once in a while the police department has a budget with their, like, COPS FAST grant where they actually mm -hmm. budget money in that special revenue fund. but. Uh, typically, we're showing it under the town's budget anyway. So is there any difference to operating budget and general fund budget? For our purposes, I would say no. So we could change it, too. Okay. 
So uh, maybe this is, um, so the operating budget for the town is really a fund budget? Okay, that's where I was kind of trying to get the, I was getting the ball. So if we were to put that back in, um, I would actually recommend putting it under reporting because it's about how we report that information, yeah. if that's okay. Yeah, just somewhere where it's preserved. So yeah. everyone, yeah. I mean, we don't have to put all of these. I mean, these bottom three, I think I would even take out, or even the bottom four that are in, on the original one because we don't usually know what those are until... Yeah, you know, those are below the ledger kind of yeah. numbers. So you're saying the last three? From overlay down on the old on the old policy. Just ignore those and do county assessment up to municipal growth. Okay. Um, although from a fund uh, from a fund balance perspective, um, it seems to me at least the tax increment financing would be um, something that'd be of interest to report since it has been an item um, mentioned by the auditors regarding, um, not the auditors, um, uh, rating agencies. The rating agencies, as far as one of the issues that was a topic of concern. Well, again, th this is trying to just come up with a, a methodology for right. consistency. Uh, I don't know if there's anything right or wrong. If we modify this, we'll have to kind of recalculate some of the historical calculations so um, we could recreate those with a, a different definition of operating budget. Okay. Sean, I also had a question. You've, uh, you've identified or by, uh, defined non-spendable, restricted, committed, assigned, and unassigned. And then on page two under classifying fund balance amounts, you use the term unrestricted. And I just I want to make sure, is that a term that needs to be defined? or I, I suppose unrestricted, is that? Unrestricted we used, even though it's not part of the Governmental Accounting Standard Board's definition, we used it because to some degree if we're only, up, and, and maybe we take this out, but right now uh, we consider committed, assigned, and unassigned are as funds that we can use because council has ultimate control over those monies. You, the council could say, we're not going to assign this money anymore. We're going to put it back to the general fund, whatever it might be. And so that became, for us, that was a term we just created so that we could specify those three pieces of the fund balance. Yep. So to Tom's point on the use of when both restricted and unrestricted funds are available for expenditure, restricted funds should be spent first unless legal requirements disallow it. I wasn't sure if there needs to be a definition of unrestricted or if that's a combination of a number of different ones. Is it everything other than restricted? Restrict, it doesn't include restricted and non-spendable. So it's committed, assigned, and unassigned would be unrestricted. So non-spendable, so the, non-spendable and restricted. So the question is, um, when both restricted and unrestricted, so we, we understand the rest unrestricted piece because it's the last three. The question is, are unassigned. Um, I think that unrestricted should be called unassigned, uncontrolled. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I, I took the template from the policymakers. I didn't okay. question the definition. Yeah, I, again, I, I didn't question. I it. just want to be this was a as clear as we can be. Ruth thought it meant uh, unrestricted would be committed, assigned, and unassigned. That's at least how we've treated it historically. All right. So, what is the recommendation, Tom? When both, uh, not when both, but when you could leave that section as it is and just provide a de we could provide a definition on unrestricted fund balance and define what that is. And Ruth tells me it is committed fund balance, assigned fund balance, and unassigned fund balance combined. So it's just adding another bullet point. Yep. Under the very last one? Yep. Okay. 
And then, Sean, somewhere along the line, you asked, and, I, and I'm not sure if it fits here, but under yeah. reporting, you said give some thought. You asked me about things you might want to see and how we break this out. And so for me, for things around like restricted funds, you know, I don't know if there's a way that some of the bigger ones can be broken out by specific. You know, so sitting here, like for instance, Wentworth yep. last year, if we'd seen Wentworth specifically had $2.6 million balance, that might lead us to ask a question. When it's lumped in a big number, right. you don't know the component. So at, at some point, I'd like to see some of these, especially the restricted funds, really broken out if they're earmarked for something, just so, you know, it doesn't have to be small items. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And but big items like Wentworth or some of the other really big bonds that are really designated, that way if the money's sitting there, you know, right. from year to year to year, and we don't see any monies coming in or going out, we can start to ask questions about, well, gee, you know, what's what's going on? And Wentworth, for, for informational purposes, it does show as a major fund on the financials in its own row, so you can see yeah. that specifically. Yeah. But okay. a lot of the other ones, uh, most of the other school and town ones, we just list... I have spreadsheets that say this is what we budgeted this year, right. this is what we spent, and then the <coughs> financial <coughs> lump school in town, school is one, town is one. But uh, So I, I don't know if it you needs to be specified in here. Yeah, that, was, that's really I'm thinking it's working right. with the finance committee around reporting <coughs> format. Um, <coughs> sorry, I'm car. Your best expert, I guess, um, on the fund balances, what would you say is the <coughs> lowest um, the lowest and even, uh, what is the average or mid-range of the balances in those accounts? In the fund balances and Any of the fund balances, yeah. So uh -huh. For projects, right? For a specific project. Yeah, the reason I, I was thinking is that you can add a comment, you can add a statement to the reporting section that says that anything that is X um, is greater than X, whether yeah. it's a percentage yeah. of something or yeah. whether it's a whole dollar value, would then be reported on a line item uh, within the, the subset of a line item. The, um, and I think it's Governmental County Standards Board, GAFBE, they require yeah. us to do something to determine if something is a major fund or not. So, for example, when we were doing Wentworth, that was considered a major fund yeah. because it was greater than 5% of different types, you know, revenues or expenditures, and then if it's over 10%, it's another thing. And so uh, the auditors do that calculation, our software yeah. package does that calculation. So. Sometimes on the financials you'll see like what shows up. Yep. You know, probably after next year, we'll probably include it one more year, and then next year Wentworth won't be a major fund anymore, so it'll go away. But something else may take its place, you know. Yep. So, but we can um, come up with a calculation on yeah. how that does. We could follow the GASB rule that says if it's greater than five percent of of revenues, total revenues or something, we would include it as a you know listed here. Um, I'm, I'm okay with that, as long as the number's not too low. And I'm not talking about the threshold, I'm talking about the actual number that gets put out that says that you should report on it. Because right. to me, in this type of a budget, $77, $80 million, to have a line item in, that, in this report of $30,000 fund right. balance doesn't necessarily drive a whole lot of uh, right. information for me. But yet, there is sometimes some, um, some people do have special um, I don't call it special interest. They have a, a special attention that they want to provide, and they may want that, but that, to me, becomes a footnote and not mm -hmm. a standard for a report right. um, kind of thinking that I have. So, I mean, I was kind of thinking whether maybe look at their recommendation about, you know, a half a million, a million dollars sort of threshold. Of okay. Kind of a big project. We just want to kind of right. say, right. okay, we've got a placeholder for... I think if it's greater than $100,000, it, it could be reported on a line item. We could do that. Any subset. Uh, the only other um, thing that I have is the, like I said, the, the, the Government Finance Officers Association or the Governmental Accounting Standards Boards, they're the ones who kind of put together the policies that we're, yep. we have to follow and um, procedures. And I guess the only thing I would suggest is maybe we put something in here that says that uh, we created a we create the policy to try and conform to the governmental accounting standards board, and um, that we'll review it periodically. If those guys change their policies, you know, if their rules change, that might affect what we do. So that was That's really language to satisfy an analyst from one of the bond rating agencies. Sure. Um, 
So, because the previous policy doesn't have that, and the policy template that MMA sent didn't have it either, do you have? Um, we, we added it for our investment policy. I think we're supposed to review it every so many years, and the same with the debt management policy. I think we review those. We're supposed to bring it to the. So, go and I'll see if I can find it. So the question I have though is that the policy doesn't conform to GASB because GASB is not a policy. It's a statement, I right? Say. Yeah. So it's a, okay. So it's, a, it's an actually a statement. Okay. If you can help me with that, that yeah, would be. Just like find that language. I mean, I, I don't think I need to have it today. No, I, I mean, I if it's, 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 it's a narrative statement, so I'm okay. If yeah. you're, are you okay? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, so the question I have uh, for you, Peter, is that with the changes, would you like to see those changes and have this come back to the committee? Um, are you okay with making the changes and having an email? Of course, communications would have to be recorded in the minutes um, if we did this by email. Um, but would you be comfortable in doing these changes by email yep. um, and then forwarding the final recommendation? Mm -hmm. uh, yep. And I think for purposes, um, We'll make sure that we, uh, for record keeping, for public access, is that um, need to make sure that we uh, copy Tom Hall, the manager, and then also call that. That way we guarantee we have an accurate accounting of everything. Yeah. I mean, to me, these are relatively minor changes in comparison. The, the most substantive piece is the, you know, resetting the benchmarks. Yeah. That's fairly, fairly large. I did want to mention, just for full disclosure, I believe the previous policy says that we have three years to bring our um, balance back into alignment if we were to go below. And this one says it's, I uh, actually changed it to two. Uh, yeah, it said five years before. But five years before, sorry. Yeah. So. Um, but then we were real low back then, so I think. Oh, yeah, it was yeah, very, very different. It was very different. To get up there. <laughs> it took the five years for us to get the policy. Yeah. <laughs> this is the first time, this is the first year, I think, ever that we've been able right. to use fund balance yep. for, for capital needs. So I think right. that's. Great. Um, so with that, just for the record, I would uh, move approval of, um, I don't even, is there a policy number to this or is there a, just fund balance policy? It's fine. As amended, um, pending further review and final acceptance. Second. Like, second. Yes. Um, anything else? No. Nope. Great. All in Thank favor? You. Two to zero. Just to go over that, so who's going to make these Chris. changes? Yeah, so we're going to incorporate these. I have the, um, the template, so Great. I'll be happy to send that to you. Um, yeah, do that. Although I think fold I in some of the additional lines. Yeah, we have it. it. You have it. So you want us to take a crack at making the changes, yes. and we'll send it around. The sooner, the better, I think. Yeah. That way. Okay. So. No, oh, you can send it around, Tom. Yep. So are, will that become the final with the changes, or yes? yes. We'd like to look at it first, just to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, we we do not need to bring it as long as we're comfortable with it. We do not need to bring it back. Yeah. If one person says they want to bring it back, then we'll bring it back. Okay. Great. Out of respect for in case Chris has any issues. We'll do it week. Yep. Um, by the way, the goal is, um, does this only require one reading? As a policy, yes. As a policy? Yep. Um, and so that would be, a goal is to present that at the November 2nd? Yeah, I actually have uh, November 16th is, uh, is another, the final option of the current council anyway. Sure, um, so we can talk about that, but I think that uh, at the very least it can go to November 2nd if there's any issues, we can always Yep. Work on it before the 16th. Table it and work on it. Yep. We have problems. Yeah, I think that'd be good. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Work. Uh, moving on to the next item, and it's uh, 10 minutes before seven, is the metrics and financial condition analysis and benchmarking. So um, I don't know how you. Uh, this is kind of a kind of a holistic conversation <laughs> at this particular point. Because we have new players and yeah. new resources and all kinds of creative ideas. How do you want to start this? Well, I'd, I'd like to take a step backward, actually. Yep. Uh, Larissa's done a fair amount of reading. She's looked at the same resource materials that, uh, that you've provided to us, Sean, and I think some other materials as well. And I think she uh, raised, a, I think, an important question. First, we ought to define why we're doing this. You know. Um, before we start to dive right into the particulars of this metric or that metric. And I, I, I might suggest that, that you really start with that kind of mm -hmm. higher level conversation. Uh, and I suspect, uh, because we've been part of these conversations right along, most of us, um, there, there's a handful of things that will probably emerge pretty quickly 
and then some other details might fall out of that as well. So I think that's really a, an important way to start. I guess the other thing from staff's perspective, I really see um, at least part of this exercise finding kind of internal factors for us to compare ourselves to ourselves. Um, we can recreate some of these uh, statistics, look backward, and then of course on a going forward basis. But then there's a whole external part to the evaluation too, kind of the benchmarking, the peer comparison piece as well. Um, and and they, they can and they should follow kind of parallel tracks. Uh, they're all part of the same effort, but they rely on different data and um, kind of serve a different purpose um, in some respects. Just uh, before I forget on the benchmarking piece, I was very pleased to hear just this afternoon the town's involved with the Metro Coalition, which is a small subset of GPCOG. These are uh, communities that are kind of first ring of Portland and Portland. Um, I had brought up um, in a conversation with the group about what our next course of business would be, and I suggested benchmarking would be of value to all of us. Yeah. And I wasn't able to attend last week's meeting, but I was pleased that this made the short list. And Cumberland County's actually stepped up and offered some staff resources. So Sean, I don't know if you were helpful in that regard, if you were. Um, if you weren't, just take credit for it anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, that's certainly something that I've asked Larissa to work on too, so we can kind of combine efforts. Um, so we're really excited about finally getting some interest and getting some folks to step up and to be part of this, um, this effort, because uh, the data really, we rely so heavily on everyone else being willing participants, provide good data and accurate data uh, on a consistent basis. Sure. So let's take, can we take this one, at, uh, one yes. piece at a time? So the first question was why. So the, now the question I have with that question is <laughs> how do you want us to communicate that? What, we can have a conversation at this level. We could um, do it as part of a group conversation with the town council as a whole. I think that at this point it's really more of a finance committee initiative that we would then roll out to the council as a whole. Agreed. Um, and each of us might have a different kind of take as to why. Um, so I'm comfortable in sharing my opinion. I don't know if you want to start that today. I mean, how do we do, can we send, write, you know, write a communication? How would you want to do that? Because I don't want to spend. I would be interested to. That could be a very long conversation. It, it could. Um, I'd be interested if you have some initial thoughts in that regard. Uh, it might be helpful. Sure. Um, you want to start? <laughs> no? I can start. <laughs> I can talk forever. <laughs> no, I, I think where this started just, just from us is, is you know, as we try to assess, I mean, metrics are important because they give you a benchmark that you can use year to year to kind of compare to. So I think there's some, you know, and the reading materials we had were great, and there's some suggestions in there, and, and Sean had asked us to look at some stuff. So, some, so, so for instance, something like, what is the debt in this town per capita? Seems like that, you know, and it's one of the bond rating things that's used. It's something that's tangible to people. People can pretty much understand that. Here's the debt per capita. So where do we stand? So I think the, the goal of some metrics is, are there some things that are really critical as being the finance committee and then as a town council that we start and want to measure? And if we have goals to say, gee, if our debt to capital is at the high end, is that the right number or do we want to reduce that? So it helps give us ways to kind of manage the business, if you will. And I think to me, the second piece of having the why is then it is sort of the, you know, what I came from an industry that always benchmarked our peers. We always looked at what others were doing. So I think it's really important that we look, as Tom had suggested, some things will be internal to our town, the things we want to achieve. But I think it's also important just to bounce that back against what some other communities around us are doing. So that to me is the importance of benchmark. If, if you don't measure it, you really can't perform. You really can't change the performance if you want to get to a different place. If you're happy with where you are, having those metrics are important because if you start to slide away from those metrics, you, you can have it more real time and all of a sudden saying, aha, you know, we've got a real problem. So that to me is the value of metrics. And I think, as Tom has said, you could go way overboard. I mean, you could, you could spend hours and hours and tons of resources doing that. I think what we wanted to do, we've talked about metrics, is at first find some real simple ones that we can take a look at and create sort of just a dashboard here, and we can report back, the finance committee can report back to the rest of the council. Here are some things we think are important to monitor, and once or twice a year we'll check in against these and kind of measure our performance and how we're doing. See, that's helpful, I mean, as opposed to just collecting data for data's sake. I mean, right. having that level of conversation is very helpful. So, um, 
for me, with everything that Peter said, um, again, I think you're going to find that, uh, generally speaking, no matter why someone runs for office, I believe that, when, I truly believe that when they get here, we all have the same common goal. We just have a different nuance to it. And really, for me, because I've been here the longest, I've been here um, almost off and on for about 15 years. So I've seen this town change dramatically from a governance perspective. And so it's gone from literally from a budgetary perspective, which is primarily what a lot of people think that's all we do, where you literally go page by page, account line by account line, asking why a $500 line increased to $1,000. Um, I mean, this is back in the old days, too. And it's really not the old days. It was only a couple of years ago that we, <laughs> we finally stopped that. Um, so it, it's really it's, um, allowing us to grow from a governance perspective as well as while the town is growing, too, because you can't do that for an $80 million budget. You could years ago when it was significantly smaller. So um, the other piece of that, my history in a governance model is that the board should be setting what are called KPIs or key performance indexes. And those KPIs should be enterprise um, wide or global statements. So as an example, the global statement really should be, I want to improve the financial position of the town. There's no other metrics that goes with that because then you determine after that, you determine here are maybe the three, four, whatever it might be, metrics that you want to look at. And then within those, you might have a couple just for finer tuning. Um, and that gets into, you saw the graph, I think that's in there, kind of talks about it. And really, um, that then leads into what I would call a balanced scorecard. And that's because this town, um, including myself, we have concentrated way too much on um, pointing fingers at individual budgets in particular and what they have done to the town or what are they contributing to the town or what they're using within the town, whatever that word you kind of want to use, rather than looking at the town as a whole and from a balanced scorecard. So if you look at that flow chart that they give in that document, it talks about, I think there were five, four areas. Um, you know, you, you do look at financial considerations, but then you need to look at, um, I think there was organizational, environmental, mm -hmm. um, community, which is like population density and, uh, you know, and you know, there's a whole bunch of things that make up Scarborough, and they all play in together. The reason why we can afford an $80 million budget is because of those other factors, and no one really is looking at that, and we're not looking at a trend of it. We simply look at year to year from election to election, this is our reaction to the current times. And we've never sat down and said, the last three years has been sustainable um, in our growth, or it has not been sustainable, and to me, these metrics will help show a trend of where we're going but then also allow us to say, this is where I want to be, and it becomes a standard goal so that you're not changing mm -hmm. that goal. Every year we should have a goal of financial stability in this town. What you might change is the metrics from year, after three years of measuring, what you're, because you want to focus on another improvement area because you've already achieved that one area, whether it's debt, revenue, expenses, whatever it might be. So it's going into the overall strategic plan of kind of like, how do I plan out 20 years mm -hmm. and where we're gonna be? Yeah, I've, I found myself, I approached it a little differently. I was pouring through the indicators and trying to pick this or that, yeah. and then I took a step back and I said, you know, what are the things that uh, people are either concerned with or interested in with? And it, I came down to three basic things. Fund balance, there's some sensitivity kind of u universally around the amount of debt we have, so debt, and tax rate, um, kind of the ability to pay. That's probably at the end of the day, that's the thing that matters to Joe Citizen. Uh, but but also to most elected officials. So I wonder if using that kind of higher uh, perspective and then drilling down if those are the three, uh, I don't say most important, but areas of interest and or concern, are there metrics or indicators we can develop around each one of those? So um, we can get some comfort and certainty around it. We can uh, establish some um, uh, benchmarks for, uh, you know, if the trend is going in a direction we don't like, that the alarm bell sounds and we stop and talk about it and come up with some strategies. If you look at that chart, that organizational chart that they provide, on the financial side, there are six, I think they call them factors, six factors within the financial piece alone. Every one of them is very important and, and it, you could actually identify at least one measure within each of them. Because looking at expenditures, if anything, I think that there's been greater attention to expenditure levels, regardless of tax increases, over the past two years. Um, than any other year before. And so there expenditures, you expenditures said? by itself, the rate of uh, increase in expenditures, regardless of what the revenue sources might be, has been a, a tremendous focus the last two years. 
um, by some citizens, and it's important. So whether it's revenue sources, expenditures, uh, debt is obviously a concern, uh, liquidity, fund balance um, is one of those. Um, and then there's, um, you know, one of the things that I'm nervous about or want to, I think capital outlay was a big one, um, debt and capital outlay, and it's about the infrastructure. So, I mean, there's one that you could identify within each one of those. Mm -hmm. um, so th the secondary piece of that is, is also it's about getting rid of, and I'm in a corporate environment, and so while I'm not trying to turn the council or the, or the town into a corporation, although it really is, um, I also want to neutralize the narrative that has often driven our debates and discussions and arguments <coughs> about the town because it's about the words that are chosen in narratives. And to me, a chart isn't narrative. It, it tells a story, but it's, it gets rid of those superfluous words that can really heighten people's emotions. Yeah, think of the opportunity. Larissa, with a fresh perspective, pointed yeah. it out. I mean, you look at this, yeah. there's only one area. Debt is the only area where we're like... Right doing very well, and, and this is a group of indicators that at least the bond rating agencies mm -hmm. are interested in. Yep. They not necessarily may not make our list, but um, there's a great narrative, a great story to tell that we're not telling. That, But for debt, we are yeah. very, very healthy from, from a um, outward looking and, and financial condition point of view. And even on the debt level, we're still well within the moderate range. I mean, it's not even elevated or high. Right. And th the other factor yeah. is the ability to pay. You know, we've got well, great capacity currently and more opportunity in the future in terms of being able to afford that debt. So, the, the, and this is the, um, the objectivity to using these dashboards is that it doesn't go into the political, I think one <coughs> of the um, categories that's in that flowchart is the political culture, it's the aptitude to debt. So while that might not be elevated as high, there are some people in town that think that moderately placed as we are is too high. So it's you know it's at least recognizing that in, in those dashboards and kind of in that some of it is um, you know it's kind of hard you know what do you choose what do you choose as a measure to measure political you know aptitude or, or you know the kind of the aptitude towards that so that's a, that could be a community survey every year I mean there's different ways that you can capture that you know correct me if I'm wrong the first time I heard metrics come up in a real serious kind of way around with this finance co committee I think both of you have been involved since this. It really came up in the context of our joint work with the schools. And mm -hmm. am I wrong in recalling that it had more to do, at least in the initial discussions, with them uh, us asking them to identify metrics or benchmarks for themselves? Let's take the laptop initiative, for instance. So how can we measure how effective this investment was? Um, more recently, they've invested, they want uh, what, 10 new teachers at the high school over two years. Again, the question is, how are we going to know whether that investment was uh, was helpful? Mm -hmm. So establish some met metrics so you can measure your success. Is that where the conversation started? Yes. It's. I'm not sure we've we haven't finished that conversation, as far as I recall. And I think, John, you're the one that led this. That we can't very well ask them to do that if we're not doing it ourselves, right? Yep. So um, I, at least as far as I understand, I believe the school department has delivered what we asked of them, which was to d give us metrics, and it is on their website. It was the five metrics that Dr. Antwistle okay, highlighted right, right, right. at the end, if you remember. And so those were at least the starting points for them, for us to use in, a, in kind of assessing where they are and to be comfortable with what they're requesting as part of the budget. To me, that's a subset of um, this whole budget, because of course, their numbers are going to be included in ours when you talk about total debt. I'm not right. looking at the municipal numbers by itself. I'm looking at the total number. But this conversation strikes me as a little different. It's, it's higher level. It's, yes. it's that financial condition analysis as opposed to uh, documenting value of an investment per se. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look. I mean, I, 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 to be honest with you, I haven't looked at it in a while. I'm trying to remember the five measures. Yeah, I don't remember either. Um, and I believe they were primarily around uh, some of the um, – the, was it the test scores? Oh, one of yeah, it's like 11th grade, grade test scores. TSAP or whatever that was called, they all come driven. So, okay. um, but it would be no different, what we asked of them would be no different if we then directed each indi individual department to come up with their own, because they're just, a, I mean, I, I hate to say just, they're a department of the town, mm -hmm. um, and so, but they're a big department of the town, they're bigger than the town all combined rest of by itself. Um, to me, that's something for you to decide if you want to then take these metrics that we're creating for the town as a whole and give it to each of your departments. That's up to you as a manager to decide if that's how you want to manage it. 
I just wanted to drive a strategic conversation about where we want to go and not do this year over year kind of analysis where um, we forget, unless you have a 15 year person on the board, you don't remember where, and I can barely remember even with that, you know, where were you 10 years ago? But uh, don't even know you go back 10. Where were you three years ago? I wasn't on the board, I can't tell you. Well, I can, but mm. it's way too long. Mm. Call us promise that I would, made me promise that it would get done tonight. You know, I think, uh, I, I think uh, Sean, you know, when he called it, you know, if, if you've been in corporations and it's when he called it key performance indicators. So, for instance, I mean, when I was, when I was at Hannaford, they, they would always do a three or five year business plan. They always picked certain things that they thought were absolutely critical to driving business success. So, it may be, you know, what was the sale per customer? Because that translates into if you're building sales per customer, then you're getting more transactions, that translates into the bottom line. So they try to identify some key metrics that drove their business and what they were trying to achieve. So for us as a town, you know, and maybe, you know, I, I think I think what Sean was describing, this may be a two-step process. I think you're right. We started to have a conversation with schools around just some metrics we had looked at is the expenditure per student, the best indicator of does that buy the best education? Or mm -hmm. there are other things that we should look at. So I think we started to really think about what is it we really want to get. It isn't necessarily how much you spend. It really is more about what do you get for what you're spending and how do you measure that, which is why I think we have mm -hmm. some of the outcomes and test scores and other things sort of in that matrix. I think for a town, and I think there was two thoughts here. The, the, the pressure to get kind of off and running was to, gee, could we find some real simple metrics that we could start to take a look at and start to incorporate into our culture and our thought process. But in the meantime, I think what Sean has suggested is absolutely right. We should have, as a town council, when we start doing strategic plans, mm -hmm. and, and I think we've had this conversation on a couple different committees now, where do we want Scarborough to be? I mean, what is, what is a healthy Scarborough? And what are those goals? I mean, is, is it a debt per capita goal? Maybe that's the wrong goal, but can we identify those key metrics that we think will help us get to where we want to be as a town, let's put those on a dashboard so that every time we sit down, we can just take a look at some simple things and just say, hey, we're nailing it, or, geez, we're not. See, that's the difference for me. Um, I'm trying to get my head wrapped around performance indicators, which tend to project into the future. This is where we want to get to, as opposed to a lot of this literature, if not all of it, was, is really the financial condition indicators. Um, which looks backward, but I, I suppose it could also be translated into projecting into the future where we want to get to. But there's a lot of base work that needs to be done before we have that second tier conversation. Right, right. We're looking. But, so I think I think we as a committee recognize that, but I think in the sh so this is a moving target where we wanted to. Oh, there are some simple things we could pick, and I, and I think actually, you know, the the report by you know Moore's and Cabot have some things already sort of pre-packaged mm -hmm. that is a starting point that wouldn't be very difficult to kind of, you know, provide. You know, and I think there were some others, and Sean asked us all to kind of look at the different literature and pick out three mm -hmm. or four different things. I, that's where I thought we were going last time is yeah. pick out three or four things that we thought might be worthwhile taking a look at, start looking at those on a, some basis, and then have the Finance Committee of the Future just keep you know, fine tuning that till we get something that really says, okay, this is this is measuring what we want to measure. So Peter's done that. I mean, you came up yeah. with eight or nine different things. Yeah, I, I think. got a little, yeah. a little carried away. <laughs> um, no, so um, I, I did not put mine into that type of format only because um, the best way for me to explain that is what I use before. That's this balanced score, scorecard. So if you look, if you look at the model, it talks about um, environmental factors, community factors. Mm -hmm. And I think that there needs to be a balance of information shared in a dashboard that covers each of those that have to then blend into each other. So, uh, you know, I don't have it. I didn't. I don't have it in front of you because I didn't actually look at it. So, you know, on the financial side, I think that's easy. You need to have. Um, all right. It's the bigger one. Page six. Yeah. That's good. There you go. Yeah, so I think that it's easy to say that you can create a financial factors dashboard that you could have one, two, three, or all of them, 
that are in each of those categories, which is revenues, expenditures, operating position, debt structure, unfunded liabilities, and condition of capital. I'm not um, sold on any particular measure, and I would take Larissa's advice on what might be the best measure to, for consideration, or, or the whole management team's sure. advice on what would be the best, mm -hmm. as long as they relate to each other or they complement each other on the conversation side. So, you know, you're not going to want to talk about um, uncollected property taxes and then talk about fringe benefits and saying that there's a correlation between the two because there wouldn't be necessarily. But I also would like to see the envir some environmental factors taken into consideration. So as an example, the one I look, property value and distribution of that value, I think is extremely important because it gets into the delivery of services. So I just want this ba that, that balance that's um, like, so p political, cultural, this gets into the, uh, what I mentioned before, attitudes towards taxes, services, and political processes. That's going to be very hard to measure. Unless you do an annual survey that kind of addresses that, it's going to be very hard to kind of, but the others, I think, are, are potentially, um, you know, you could include them. You know, um, I probably wouldn't do national trends because I could care less what the rest of the U.S. does in comparison to Maine. Um, but regional is important statewide. Um, you know, so there's different factors. And I would, I'm not looking for anything in particular as long as they are covered. And I think Peter's, um, you know, revenues are important because it funds expenses. Expenses are important in comparison to revenues because of the operating position that you're in. They all fl flow together, and I think that if we cover at least a little bit of each, um, so long as that, that measure is then used going forward. So if we're going to pick um, uh, long percent of long-term debt, then that should be something that we're looking at controlling or whatever it might be as a goal, you, you know, that we set a goal with that as part of the overall funding. So remember the KPI, the big level, was um, improving the financial position of the town. Mm -hmm. The individual metric can be that one piece, and then you set a goal based on that one piece. And it ties into the other four, three, two, whatever it might be. So I'm okay with you kind of helping us get to that point. I don't have any particular one. Okay. And, you know, I'd be okay with whatever the others are recommending in that area as long as there is a, a balance. The one piece I do want to say is, um, and I did want to sh at least share, um, so I'm also kind of a little OCD, and um, having done this for a living, I just want to share uh, some examples of those um, kind of dashboards, because it, it depends on the level of uh, information that wants to be shared and measured, and then the benchmark. So um, th the real piece that I want to kind of, if I could turn you to that, if you don't mind, is actually the last page of the stapled one, because I think this is a good um, stage one. So if you take this grid, which is a very basic grid without the graphs and without everything, you could apply this grid to our current town council goals, and which the goals become the KPIs, and then you would then have a subset. Um, now, this is not titled necessarily accurately because what you would want is what is the measure that was within that. So I think like on a financial position, we set as a goal th um, no more than 3% or whatever the verbiage was. Um, so that would be the measure, and then here is what your um, your status is, or this is what your final quarter performance is, and then you would have a positive arrow because we did achieve our goals. But at the same time, you would then show a what is your three-year average in doing that. Which the reason why I picked on that is because we have a very good three-year average, which is like 2.5 percent over three years. So um, that way, you're incorporating both the individual measure and you're incorporating a trend and you're seeing where it's going, and hopefully, I hope that the next council takes that on as a continued goal because it should be a, a KPI that carries forward. So do you see where I'm going? Mm -hmm. do, do you remember that narrative form? If you, could, if you remember the narrative form, it was kind of like you had your bullet, the major bullet, which is your KPI, and then there was these sub-bullets underneath it, and that becomes your measures. Yeah, this is helpful. Yep. Um, the only thing I wanted to ask, though, is that um, as you consider going forward um, on, the t on the town side, and this could be this is personal opinion, so it, you know the other councils could say I'm totally wrong. I actually don't agree with peer analysis um, unless it is an average of our peers. So I don't feel I personally do not want to measure Scarborough against Falmouth, Cumberland, whatever that might be, because um, I think that there is a peer set, and we can say this is what the average of our peers are because we get into this we've, and we've gone through this. You know, we're not the Cape Elizabeth, and we're not the Falmouth, and we're not the Sanford. I mean, we've been trying to, you know, a lot of people try to compare us to wrong groups. Um, I just think that there needs to be a peer group definition. We did that on the school side, and it should be the average of the peer group rather than individual towns. 
Besides, the, the graph gets too busy. <laughs> when you get 10 peers, I mean, then you're trying to figure out, where did that line go? <laughs> so I don't know how Peter feels or how the rest of the board feels, but um, that's enough from a peer perspective, that's enough for me. Yeah, I understand your point. I think I think we are going to invest some time and effort into that. Um, only when the data we are confident in the data that can be yeah. equalized and probably boiled down to per capita reporting. Uh, only then can it be comparable in, in some respects. But even then, it's limited. Yep. Um, and, and you know, we've talked about this in the past about definitions. Okay, so when you define something that you're going to put into a graph and a trend. Um, there's been a lot of conversations about, well, does it include this or not include that? And then when you compare it against it, this is why I don't want to compare against another town, is whether or not they have it, because there's a lot of towns that don't include it, because they rely more heavily on county government or um, whatever reason it might be. Um, for me, um, as long as our data is consistent from year over year and how we define that, that's what matters. Um, so if it's something is excluded, all that does is if you include it, it changes the graph from being down here to being up here or from up here to be down here. And you still set your benchmark because it's about the trend that you're looking at, the slope of the curve and not the points in time. I understand. Larissa, do you have any questions or any input in what you I know, the first day, I'm sorry. No, I'm good. Um, I have no questions. And I guess the only place I'd, I'd be Sean with that is, <coughs> you know, and I don't know how you're doing this, I mean, this is like a third generation down. I mean, you said you're not interested in, in national information or the problem with comparing yourself to like the average of your peer group. If you're using those, then you can, you can tend to get average performance. And maybe we want average performance, but one thing that we tried to do, at least when I was at Hannaford, is the other benchmark is who are the industry leaders? I mean. That's where yeah. you get, that's where it pushes your envelope. You know, who's, so at some point, it, it, it's great to have the average as your peer yeah. group, but if there's some source that starts to say, who's really nailing it, then that, I agree. then that gives you a real opportunity to kind of benchmark and really elevate your game. So if you just compare to the average, you're average. If you compare yep. to the best, then you get better. So. And you guys do that on your school aspirational list of, of schools. Know. One of the things that I've talked to a couple of your department heads about is asking them the communities that they feel are equal within certain parts of their budget. Mm -hmm. So um, community services, okay? For us to compare community services across communities mm -hmm. doesn't make a lot of sense if we are offering adult ed and other communities are not, or we're offering after school and before, before and after care yep. and other communities are not. So I sat down with Bruce very brief, briefly and he gave me a list of um, the towns that and kind of started to think about how to break them down. So if we are going to compare ourselves to a Thalmas or a Cape Elizabeth, let's make sure that we're comparing specific parts of this budget. Yes. So I think that there could be places for benchmarking if we had a specific area that we were interested in, making sure that the benchmark is targeted. So we're not saying, what is our public works budget compared to the neighboring towns? Well, that doesn't make any sense, but we could perhaps look and see what is the cost that we are spending on um, plowing by lane mile compared to other communities plowing by lane mile, right? Because then, what, then it, we're not per capita at that mm -hmm. point because it wouldn't make sense to divide your public works budget right. by capita. Right. It would make right. sense to divide it by your lane mile. Yeah. So I think that if we have something that we're interested in, in, in targeting to who's doing things well, yeah. and that would also, though, depend on we don't want to decide what does well mean. Right. So somebody might have the lowest public works plowing budget per lane mile, but they also might have really bad roads that people <laughs> have accidents on. Right. So I mean, right. that doesn't mean that they're doing it well. That's a good point. I agree. I was going to say this aspirational group. It's, uh, but even if you remember, oh, yeah. three of us, four of us remember, <coughs> using the word aspirational group was also contentious because a lot of people would say, well, why do you have to be like the aspirational group? So we just have to be prepared. And some people understand. said it's an average, average is okay. Yeah. We're, we're doing fine. That's well, good. Uh, so, yeah, I so I hope that, because yeah, I had promised, uh, like two years I think, I promised to show you at least what a dashboard might look like. So the level is up to you kind of folks. Um, mm -hmm. The goal is to give you a snapshot. It depends. For the non-financial person, it's to give them a snapshot of where we are. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of graphics and tools out there. So does that yeah. help? Th it does. Yeah. And you have been promising this for a while, so I thank you for you know, finally get to it. <coughs> Well, good. This is clearly work that's very much in.
process in progress. Uh, it's going to span undoubtedly into the next finance committee, but it's, it's work that the staff's committed to doing, and I'm sure we'll have, um, you know, a willing finance committee. I suspect one or more of you will continue on. Uh, so I, I don't fear that this is going to get, you know, lost in the shuffle, so to speak. It's going to be something we'll work on. So is it drinking? It's like drinking through a fire hose. <laughs> no, it's um. I really. This is actually a conversation I rather enjoy. This is. And I do think it's very positive that the county, because I've always thought that, and Tom, you and I have yeah. had this conversation, the county could be a powerhouse for uh, data as a data resource, and really be um, kind of a depository of everyone's financial information guaranteed. That's a huge amount of investment in technology and systems, but um, it really, I mean. And Alex, nobody does it. Alex Kimball, their finance directors. Nobody does it. Quite good. So um, hopefully we can work together with them and, and get a program out there that many of us can benefit from. Great. Anything else? Oh, thank you. Great. Um, next item is future meeting dates and times. I think that we're all in consensus um, that at this point, um, barring any issues with the fund balance policy, that this will be the last uh, finance committee meeting of this um, um, Council calendar year, um, understanding that the council will change. Is it, is it the 16th? It is. So it'll change on the evening of the 16th. So a new chair um, and members will be identified of the finance committee then, and I'm sure that we'll get started fairly quickly. Uh, talk about uh, water. You've been a selectman, uh, select woman, so you know budget starts immediately with us. Um, so it's going to be a lot of work. Um, so much fun. So much fun. Um, so with that in mind, uh, anybody in the public that would like to speak? Colette? Okay. Ms. Kluke? No. And uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. All in favor. Thank you. I should have voted no. <laughs> Just